have all the flowers gone. I enjoyed every minute of it, tell you the truth. And uh, I go through it all again if I had to. But I was lucky, really, to survive it all. Where so many of my friends didn't. Will they ever learn? This is the story of the unsung heroes of the Second World War. Female pilots whose exceptional skills and bravery remain legendary even today. Long time passing. Where have all the young girls gone? Long time ago. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on beaches, landing grounds, in fields, in streets, and on the hills. We shall never surrender. The Second World War remains one of the most devastating events in history, involving most of the world's nations. The cost to human life remains one of the most tragic consequences. Long time ago. There were times of leadership, times of immense suffering, and times of exceptional courage and bravery. Will they ever learn? Bravery on the ground, at sea, and in the skies. Bravery by men and bravery by women. The women of Britain refused to be left out. There was more than seven million women were mobilized one way or the other in the war effort. Some 450,000 were in uniform. Uh, more than half a million were with the emergency services with civil defense. One area in which women played a major role was within the Air Transport Auxiliary. The ATA was a civilian organization set up in 1939 to assist the RAF with ferrying planes, thus relieving many personnel for duty in the battle. The role of the ferry pilots was to move aircraft, basically the new aircraft coming out of the factories to the squadrons to replace aircraft which had either been lost in action or had had some problem uh, with, with them and they would replace those aircraft as quickly as they were needed. Usually each morning when you arrived at Ferry Pool, you would know exactly what aircraft you were going to move first thing that morning, and then during the day other aircraft would be uh, sent through to you, or you would be told during that day that you had to move other aircraft. In late 1939, Pauline Gower, an experienced pilot who worked for the Civil Air Guard, was appointed the task of establishing a women's section of the ATA. She was the one who was most effective in persuading those in Whitehall that women could do this job. And she was very much the leader of the introduction of women into ATA flying. She was stationed at HQ, which was at White Waltham, so one didn't see her too often. But she was a splendid person terribly sweet and kind. She did everything. She, she managed to get women into the air transport auxiliary and she uh, just pursued this. And so we were flying everything. We were flying all these military airplanes, which was absolutely wonderful. Eight women were initially invited to become ferry pilots for the ATA by Pauline Gower. They were all established pilots with many hours of flying experience. One of these was Joan Hughes, who at 17 was the youngest female flyer in Great Britain. Of course, there was a hitch about the women. Um, there was a, quite a strong feeling in Whitehall that women should never do this kind of job. There were the King's regulations which stopped women taking part in combat in any shape or form in the three armed services. And although in this case they wouldn't be required to perform combat operations, there was still a strong feeling that women were not suitable for this task and should never be employed in it. The women from the Civil Air Guard, who'd been flying side by side with the men, um, had to fight to be allowed to get in too. They didn't, weren't allowed in until the summer of 1940. 
and they were put on their own at Luton, near the de Havilland factory, because they thought they'd only let them fly tiger moths. But I suppose in the first few months, they proved themselves as just good flyers. And by the time I got in, of course, we were flying everything. The editor of an aviation magazine once stated, the menace is the woman who thinks that she ought to be flying a high-speed bomber when she really has not the intelligence to scrub the floor of a hospital properly. However, the first eight ladies did prove themselves capable of becoming ferry pilots. And as more pilots were needed, more and more ladies were invited to join the Air Transport Auxiliary. I suppose I wanted to fly after I'd been up with my brother at an air display and I thought, well, that would be fun to do if there was a war. And so when the opportunity came up, I contacted him and said, put my name forward, and he did. And eventually they asked me to come for an interview. By then they'd run out of all pilots with more flying than I'd done. I'd only done four hours solo, four and a half hours solo. But um, it was enough to start and it showed I could fly. As the devastating effects of the Battle of Britain became more apparent, the demand for ferry pilots was higher than ever before. As a consequence, the Air Transport Auxiliary began training people who had never flown before to become pilots. Summer of 1943, I saw a news item that said uh, ATA, Air Transport Auxiliary, had uh, run out of qualified pilots and were training ab initio, training from scratch. So I applied and um, was accepted. It was the first time I'd, I'd really seen an aeroplane except high up in the sky. I didn't even drive a car, of course, because 16 and a half, I was too young to drive. And in wartime, there was no petrol for teaching people to drive. Both Joy and I applied and uh, we got in together. But I was free to do that because I was a war widow. My husband had just been killed bombing Berlin. And um, one ha there was no prescription in those days for women, but one had to do something for the war effort, you know, do something useful for the war. Uh, my parents just had the, 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 the two daughters flying. Uh, I had no brothers. And I expect they thought, well, having daughters, um, it was OK. And then we picked on the, just about one of the most dangerous things to do in the war. I think I must have been about 18, 17 or 18 at the time. And then the opportunity came when I joined the forces, I joined the WAF. And I stayed there until I saw an advert, and it said, wanted volunteers required to train as pilots for air transport auxiliary, which I'd never heard of before, but... It was one of those things, and I just applied. And uh, I, was, I didn't think for a minute that I would have been accepted because I thought thousands of people would have applied. The ladies who joined the ATA were not only from Great Britain, but from around the world. Ladies joined to help in the battle from Canada, New Zealand, South Africa, the USA, the Netherlands, Poland and Chile. I went to England at the beginning in April of 1941 with, as a volunteer for the Free French Air Force. Uh, the General de Gaulle made a call on the 18th of June of 1940 asking all the French people to come to help him at England. So I went for, I, I was once volunteer to go with him then. Because uh, the French Air Force didn't, use, uh, didn't have any women. And a French pilot who knew me, he wrote to me telling me that it was an organization where they employ women for fly. So I asked permission to, to the French to go with the English, and I was seconded to, to the ADA training that was most interesting because it was concentrated into a very short period of about three months and normally it would take a year. Well it, it was in about five to six stages. Uh, you, you started out, most pilots were given 
an extensive cross-country flying course because we were going to fly without radio, without any radio aids. So our knowledge of cross-country flying by dead reckoning was going to be good. Uh, our headquarters was at White Waltham, but the training school was at Tame. And so I reported to Tame, and we had a, a nine-day technical training course, it was called. I remember the first morning, uh, he took the, the engineer, ground man, took about six of us out to one, a small plane, you know, lifted up the cowling and said to all of us, ask me questions about anything you don't know. Well, of course, I could barely drive a car. So I had absolutely no idea what was under this, <laughs> this metal cowling. I went through a bit of training and eventually found myself flying Harvards and from there to Hurricane and Spitfires which were very, very easy, really, quite straightforward. We had 12 hours in which to solo. And uh, if you didn't solo in 12 and a half hours or 12 hours, you were just said, well, beg you, beg, we don't need you anymore. There were about 16 different ferry poles dotted around the country at different airfields. Uh, some were larger than others. Uh, some flew only one type of aircraft or two or three types of aircraft. We were cadets while we trained, but once we were fully qualified to, to fly single engines, we were third officers, and I was posted to Hamble on the south coast on the Hamble River, which was near the Supreme factory at uh, Eastleigh. To start with, I was a cadet, and I was stationed at Barton in the Clay, which was a grass airfield, and was for initial training. After that, I went to Hamble. My last rank was first officer. That means that I could fly every kind of aeroplane of one engine or two engines. And I was stationed at Hamble. Uh, for the most part, I was stationed at number 15 ferry pool, which was at Hamble. And my rank was first officer Mary Wilkins. <laughs> All aircraft by ATA was organised from the Central Ferry Control at Andover in Hampshire. They would, during the night, sort out which aircraft had to be moved from where and to where. That would then be telephoned through to the various ferry pools around the country, and by the time we arrived first thing in the morning, uh, we would know what aircraft we were going to move and which aircraft we would fly that day. Uh, we were given a, a day's work, Chitty, and then we knew well, we had to go. We also knew what aeroplane we had to fly. So we had to grab our maps, an overnight kit, and then go off in the Anson, and they would take us to where the aeroplane uh, was. We flew scores of different types of aeroplanes, everything from a Tiger Moth to a Spitfire to a Wellington bomber to a Lancaster bomber. Some of them even flew flying boats. And quite often, the aircraft they flew, they had never clapped eyes on before. That's what makes it really amazing. They had training in a twin-engine bomber, and then they went and flew all the other twin-engine bombers. And anybody who knows anything about flying is permanently amazed by the achievements of these men and women. It was such a wonderful job, you know, having two or three different planes in the same day, and all so different. I flew well, mostly single-engine fighters, of course. Spitfire, Hurricane, Barracuda, um, Mustang, a lot of training aircraft, you know, the Moths, and um, Hellcat. Oh, it was all so delightful, flying aeroplanes. I love flying the fast and furious ones. I also like flying the, the bombers. There were quite a few that I enjoyed, too. Some very slow ones where you could sort of sit back and look at the countryside was rather pleasant. And then other very fast ones when you had to keep your wits about you to make sure where you were. Well, I was very fond of the tiger moth, mm. funnily enough, and um, they used to save those for me, actually, at Hamble. If there was one going, I nearly always got it. Uh, unfortunately, they thought I liked the other things as well, and I didn't. Uh, well, I was based up in Scotland, and of course, most of the aircraft that I flew then were for the fleet air arm, like the Barracuda, 
and I was called the Barracuda the Queen. They used to shout at me, Annette of the Barracuda Inn, and I used to love going up in it. I had one that I did not like flying, and that was a, a walrus, which, oh, in the air, it was impossible. It had a mind of its own, and no matter what the pilot did, it would go uh, its way, and, and it was terrifying at times. But eventually, <laughs> I found that it could be controlled, and I flew several afterwards. But it, for what all they say, it was the hurricane that won the Battle of Britain, and I find a lot of us get cross because it doesn't always get the credit it should. I flew the hurricane, but nothing special. It was just an ordinary aircraft, as far as I was concerned. The, fire, the, the Spitfire was very, very special. You just had to touch it with your little finger and it would do exactly what you wanted it to do. This, oh no, the Spitfire was a life unto its own. It was just beautiful. The ladies flew various different types of planes and each had their favorites and least favorites. One plane that the ladies all seemed to agree on was the Spitfire. I was the first one to try a Spitfire out of that field. Uh, one Sunday, amidst great drama. Uh, nobody else there, a rather worried instructor, you know, would we both crash, but it was all right, it's a lovely aeroplane. And I suppose they thought if I could do it, any fool could, so everybody flew it, and I was passed out as fit to fly the thing. I looked forward to flying a Spitfire. I wanted to fly a Spitfire, not because they were so different from everything else, but it was... Everyone said, have you flown the Spitfire? And so I thought, well, obviously, there must be something I must do. And eventually the day came when I'd flown a Hurricane and I'd flown the Harvard, and now my chit was Spitfire. The instructor would get out of the last advanced trainer and he'd say, do you want to try the Spit? And of course, there was only room for one person in a Spit, so you were on your own. And I remember the first spit I took it, gosh, it felt as if somebody kicked me in the rear end and the next thing I knew I was at a thousand feet. It was different from anything we'd ever flown. It's very difficult to describe flying a Spitfire. A very small cockpit, very maneuverable, the slightest touch on the stick, and she moved. It was the nearest thing to flying yourself. Everyone loved the Spitfire. She was a little bit difficult to land because she had a very narrow undercarriage. And if you were on grass and you could be landing exactly into wind, you know, the, the, they were telling you to come down into wind, it was fine. But if you had to land on the runway and it wasn't exactly into wind, you couldn't sort of wheel it in, you had to try to three-point it because it was more difficult. And remember, the, the instructor just driving, telling me to take the aircraft down the runway and then stopped. And there was a Spitfire beside me and he, and he just said, off you go. And I said to Mimi, what do you mean, off I go? He said, there's the aircraft, go into it and fly it off. Uh, I knew the um, son of, the, of, of R.J. Mitchell, Gordon Mitchell, uh, belonged to my local Spitfire Association and I told him it was we ladies, uh, it was a ladies aeroplane and he said I don't think dad uh, had that in mind when he uh, invented it, Joy, <laughs> when he designed it. I managed to get up and then when I was up I kept on saying to myself how am I going to hell am I going to get down but uh, it comes to those who wait and I waited and I waited and eventually went did my circuit, we had to do a circuit, and eventually I landed. And I, I couldn't get out of the aircraft, I was so excited. <laughs> I wanted everybody but to know everybody. But there, eventually everybody did know, if I told them often enough. I felt like I was in a stupendo. It was a plane in the air, it was beautiful, the earth not so Eh, como he hecho para las mujeres, en realidad. Todo está justo. El, el cockpit y todo. Y además, la sensibilidad del avión era también como de mujer. I would call it a ladies' aircraft. Of course it wasn't. But there was never a plane designed 
for a lady to fly better than Spitfire. It was, it was just the most wonderful plane to fly. You could almost breathe on the controls and they would move. You know, you, it, it was so light to the touch. Coordination was what you needed really to fly. Those lighter planes, I'm sure a little more muscle is needed when they're flying the big ones now. But with the, with the fighters early in the war, it was, that was what was needed, I think, a light touch. I think that's why the women had a very good record for, for delivery, you know, with no accidents. The Spitfire is the most beautiful aeroplane. In the air, it's absolutely gorgeous. It really is. It, it has no vices and it's, it's absolutely wonderful and it's a beautiful aeroplane and it's so, so simple to uh, operate in the air. The ladies had some fantastic times in these beautiful machines, but not all ferry jobs went exactly to plan. The day that I broke the spit, I was blamed for it. It was pilot error. I'd been flying them for a long time too. It wasn't that I didn't know what I was doing. I was just careless, I suppose. Uh, if you know anything about flying, every plane has a stalling speed, which means if you let the, the speed go below that, the plane just falls out of your hands. So you have to bring it in at that speed at least, or a little over, uh, in order to land it. And then you can throttle back, of course, and lose your speed. Well, I came in and I held off above the runway uh, by a couple of feet more than necessary, I expect, and it dropped and I burst the right tire and it skewed around a bit and the end of the wing scraped on the ground. And of course, that, it would have had to have been repaired after. And the ambulance came out, but I wasn't hurt, I just broke a nail. And I was very embarrassed because some man I quite admired, some pilot was waiting there to pick me up and take me home. And I was so embarrassed <laughs> of all people to break a spitfire in front of him. At about mark 12 or 14, they changed the old Merlin to a much stronger Griffin engine. And uh, the girls had warned me, because it was my first of that type, that uh, they had a lot of torque, uh, swing to the right on takeoff, open up gently, a very powerful engine, and a uh, full left rudder. I did everything I was told, but uh, uh, I was still making for the Southampton Barrage balloons. But it was just a second or two that you, you, you get a bit frightened. And the minute you get up into the airstream, of course, the, the controls work and um, uh, you get back on track again. And that was uh, one life I got away with. I did have a little <laughs> incident in the Spitfire. I took off and I couldn't get the undercarriage right up. And so I couldn't get any green lights, and I had red lights. And I didn't quite know what to do, so I flew around and, and round and, and tipped it up on every angle I could possibly think of to try and get the undercarriage down. But um, it wouldn't come down and it wouldn't go up, so there was no alternative. As you know, we had no uh, ways of telling people on the ground, so I eventually decided I must land and I came in. It was, fortunately, it was a, a grass field and I uh, switched the engine off just as I crossed over the hedge and landed on the field. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I bent the aeroplane a little, but I didn't hurt myself. I was very sad to think the Spitfire was not as it should be. I was taking a, a Spitfire out of a, somewhere in Leicestershire and you always take off with the canopy, the hood open of course, in case you may have to make a forced landing because take off is the most dangerous time. And I put my hand up to shut the hood and it flew away. Uh, so I, I felt the controls that it hadn't hit the, one of the ailerons or anything and just did a circuit and landed back. And I got the feeling they thought, oh, stupid woman. But when they looked in the, um, the sort of logbook every uh, air car carries, it had said canopy trouble, canopy trouble. It had had a lot of the hood trouble. So they uh, realised that I had pulled the wrong loop, that, I, that, that it was genuine. 
some of the ferry pools were completely women pilots. No men were, were, were based there at all. So uh, there was a lot of experience, and some of these women were absolutely first-class pilots. Or should I say they were all first-class pilots. There were only 165 women. There were 700-odd men, about 1,000 altogether in our outfit. In those days, a women, a place of women was rather shaky, whether they were popular or not. And I, quite frankly, didn't care. I just wanted to fly. I was flying a Wellington one day, and um, I landed at the airfield, I taxied in, and then uh, the uh, ground crew came out to pick me up. There was this great big Wellington beside me, and I said, can, can we go, because I have to get my chit signed. And they said, uh, no, we're waiting for the pilot. And I said, oh, well, I am the pilot. And to my amazement, they didn't believe me, and they went and searched the aeroplane. <laughs> they found no one. When I joined ATA, I went to Hatfield, uh, the small group of the ATA women retained there at that time, and it was a lovely little lady, Joan Hughes, one of the most distinguished lady pilots in this country. Uh, she saw me into ATA, gave me my um, test flight, and then gave me a little bit of polishing up of my flying technique, and finally passed me through as being acceptable for ATA ferry. But I did land on an American station once, and the commander came out and said I was the first lady pilot he'd met. So he said, I'm going to give you something that you'll remember me by, and he gave me a silver dollar. And I still have the silver dollar. It's, it's quite a nice and memento. I remember one plainly that I delivered to a Polish squadron, and it was a new mark. The, the marks went up to 16 on a spit. And the, uh, four or five of the fellows from the squadron were waiting out on the tarmac when I pulled in because they knew it was a new plane and they were anxious to see it, I expect. They were expecting me. They were a bit surprised that a, a bond got out, but anyway. It was rather nice, I thought, to deliver it to the men who were anxious to have it. Some of these remarkable ladies even flew the very latest and fastest aircraft. I did fly a jet. I was one of two girls that were allocated to fly jets, and I flew a meteor. I'd never seen one before, but I was taken to the factory. And then I asked the test pilot, this is different, what should I know about this? And he said, well, not, not anything really, except uh, watch the fuel gauge, because it goes from full to empty in 35 minutes, and uh, make sure you're on the ground. <laughs> so, uh, that was my instruction on a jet. Humble, where I went, was an all-women's pool. We had all women's, all men's, some mixed pools. We had Polish girls, uh, girls from South America, and um, the, the restroom at Humble, where we were waiting to fly, I feel now would make a very good television programme, because there were people playing bridge in one corner, backgammon in another, uh, the Spanish people chattering together, the Polish people chattering together. It was, uh, and we all got very well together. There were, there, as far as I know, there was never any, any uh, problems at all with a, a lot of women working together. The ladies worked long and demanding hours during the war and rarely had time off. But when they did, they made the most of it. I was thinking mostly some of our most exciting times, of course. We, we flew 12 days on, working solidly, and then two days off. And of course, every time we got two days up, we'd go to London. And I suppose this is why we got so much attention, because of our uniforms, which were a dark navy with um, gold wings and gold stripes on the shoulder. And I had one, one American ask me once, was I free French? Because they also had, a, I felt like saying neither free nor French. We had boyfriends all out of the place. And some of them would say, please wear your uniform. And some would say, don't wear your uniform. 
And w when we got home, we used to discuss this. We never figured out why they wanted us to wear the uniform and why they didn't want us. I remember the family I usually went to in London and stayed they were on 66 Park Lane, and the father would call up when some of us arrived for the weekend uh, to the American Embassy and say to them, could you send over four of your men? And we'd take them out to dinner and all the clubs, and they, had a, they loved it. They had a lovely time with us. But of course, in those days, it wasn't when you say boyfriends or girlfriends, it wasn't the way it is today. My father used to wait up for us to get home from the movies when he knew what time it, I was 18. And he still wanted to know how long it took me to get home from the theater so that he would wait up for us. I mean, it was, I didn't know which end of a boy was which in those days. It's so different from now. We were all issued with the first class travel tickets on the train. So if we were stuck out anywhere, we couldn't get back because of bad weather or anything. We were entitled to use a first-class ticket to train to, us, to take us home. So we were always rather spoiled. I did fly quite low sometimes because I, I would see someone's house, which I knew, and I could go beat up, I think it was called, which was rather naughty, but it, uh, it, it was fun and, and it was quite safe, so that was all right. The ladies had many great experiences during the war and they certainly never got bored. They would often find themselves flying planes they had never flown before, in which the only instructions they got were from a set of ferry pilot notes. Well, it was very exciting stepping into a plane you hadn't flown before, but really you just needed to know that the takeoff speed, landing speed, stalling speed, and I guess it's equivalent to step into a car you haven't driven before. It's not, not all that different. And it was only um, you in the plane. <laughs> you didn't feel you had anyone else to be responsible for. So, yes, I suppose a little nerve-wracking at first, but we were young. You know, nothing, nothing phased us. Rather like youngsters today, bungee jump or do all sorts of things. I used to frighten myself silly sometimes by not knowing quite where I was and hoping things would come up. But I'd sort of prepared the flight before I left, so I knew what to look out for, and eventually the landmarks would come out, as well, provided I flew on a steady course. Oh, of course I got lost. I, I. That was, you would land then on an aerodrome because you could see it on the map. And you would land there, but you never admitted you were lost because nobody would tell you that. So what you used to do is to go in and have a look at the notice board and you'd look where the buses came from and the local buses would tell you. And you'd look at your map and you'd see where the town was. And then, and then you would say, that's where I am. When I asked him, where is Chile? I told him, in Enfield. And I said, where? In Enfield? No, in Enfield, no, in Enfield, in Enfield yes. <laughs> but where? Enfield? No, in Enfield. I had to go in my first cross country. I lost it because I had to go near Londres. It was very bad. It was in February and it was raining and it was raining. Y primera vez que me largaban así a hacer un cross country, también la instructora yo creo que se le pasó el tejo ahí. Y yo también no había dicho que no. Y ahí me perdí y llegué al... al me metí en Londres, al balón, entre el balón barracha de Londres, que era muy estúpido los balones. Cuando me di cuenta que estaba en, en medio de Londres y entre los balones, empecé a salir mirando el que, el que veía, pero no sé cómo yo llegué a la mitad de Londres sin chocar con ningún balón. Y al último ya no tenía benzina, vi un pequeño potrero y me, me, me fui a aterrizar ahí de, de emergencia, rompí el avión. Pero no me rompí yo. I think if you went into bad weather, that was really... And that was your own fault, because nobody could have persuaded you to go in there. You went in on your own. And they wouldn't have they wouldn't have said anything to if you had landed and just said I couldn't go any further. The weather had closed in. 
they wouldn't accuse you of any failure or anything. They were really very good to us and gave us a lot of leeway. Many Air Force people say they, they can't uh, understand why they didn't give us some basic uh, uh, instrument rating training. But I feel it was a matter of a, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing if they couldn't train us fully. And I always cite the instance of Amy Johnson, who was a, a, an experienced pilot, and she took off from uh, Squires Gate uh, near Blackpool, uh, probably in weather that uh, some of us would not have taken off in. Uh, got away above ten tenths cloud, couldn't come down, ran out of petrol, uh, was hopelessly lost over the Thames estuary, and had to bail out, ran out of petrol. And um, uh, she was seen by a, a little naval coastal vessel, saw the Oxford aircraft come down first, then the parachute, and someone dived over and got hold of her, but it was uh, January, and I believe he was suffering from hypothermia, and uh, uh, Amy's body was never found. And that's an instance of how um, perhaps had they given us some uh, instrument rating training, we might have taken risks that they didn't want us to, to take. I realised the first time I got into cloud and had to come out again, I didn't really know how to do it. And I thought, well, this is stupid. You know, I'm sure to get into cloud. And so I'd better learn to um, fly blind, which I did. And I used to practice probably quite illegally sitting in my plane with everything shut down and flying on the instruments. There was one time when we all got, uh, we hadn't flown for days, it was in the summer, and we got priority aircraft. And I remember everybody was sent out very late in the afternoon to try and clear the lot. And um, there was low cloud coming in and all sorts of things. And I thought I'd follow the railway line, which normally I never did. And I was going up to Bryce Norton. I thought, well, pick it up at Devizes and go round. And um, well, I got to Wooden Bassett that we heard, hear so much about. I saw the church really too closely, and Lionel was above me. So I thought, well, the time has come to do something. So I climbed up and went into Lionel, and everybody was on the circuit. We were surprised. Aircraft had come from every direction. We were all getting into land. And the funny part was it cleared. It was a cold front clearance shortly after that beautiful evening. But I remember one of the instructors said to me one time, do you want to fly backwards? And I said, how do you mean backwards? And he said, I'll take you up in a tiger moth. And the wind is so strong, he said, we'd be flying backwards. And right now, when I went up in the tiger moth with him, the, the wind was so strong coming forward, because we went into wind, uh, we actually went backwards. But it, was, uh, it, it wasn't something I really wanted to do again. Well, people have asked if it was dangerous. I mean, everything in the war, everything somebody did was dangerous. The barrage balloons scared me because they had chains hanging from them. And if you hadn't memorized the routes through in the morning before you took off, if you suddenly came upon them, you know, you wouldn't know. You'd have to go around because you wouldn't know how to get through them. I suppose you know where the balloons are. Well, we did up till yesterday, so long as they put no new ones up. Good, that's fine. Would you sign here? Right. I didn't I ever feel afraid, I must admit. I'd never felt afraid. I must say, sometimes when I was up in the air, flying around doing a circuit, and I would look down and I would see where I had to land, sometimes I got up and said, oh God, how am I going to get down there? I was flying over the New Forest, and suddenly there was no noise, and the engine had stopped, and I knew I couldn't stay up there, so I had to look around to see quickly where I could land and I saw a little field and then I did all the manoeuvres necessary to land the aircraft in this little field, which I did. That was all right. And then I had to be rescued myself because the cows and the horses came round as, as they wanted to know what on earth was going on. <laughs> Some of the most amusing things that happened to me was I was flying over Kukubrishar. I can never pronounce that right, Kukubrishar. And I smelled this thing, I smelled, and I thought, oh, that must be the lavender coming from the hills. So I opened the canopy, and right enough, the smell did get a bit stronger until I looked down, 
and the hydraulic fluid had burst all over my feet. And what I was smelling was the hydraulic fluid all around my feet. No, I had no accidents, except at one minor incident when I had a tyre burst on takeoff, and uh, the undercarriage was pulled off and the aircraft pretty well wrecked until eventually it came to a stop and I was able to get out with everybody else because we were fully loaded with about 12 people on board the Anson. And uh, we all crept out and we all seemed all right. The next day we realised we were covered in bruises, but otherwise we were perfectly all right and went on flying. I was flying in some bad weather one day and I think I strayed a little off course and suddenly I saw puffs of smoke around me and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm being shot at. And uh, I, I thought, uh, I'd better turn around and get out of here. So I did a 180 and off I went and I didn't hear any more about it. But I think it was the ground crew, they mistook uh, the aeroplane because I was going the wrong way. No disparaban los mismos ingleses tanto la artillería antiaérea como como los barcos, porque habían zonas que estaban totalmente prohibidas sobrevolarla y uno en mal tiempo la sobrevolaba, entonces no disparaban. But I have a friend who flew right into the Firth of Forth and uh, sat on the bottom of the Firth of Forth before she opened the canopy, and the canopy air, the bubble of air in the canopy took her up to the surface. And funny, funny enough, my husband was on board a ship and one of his cabin boys was on the ship that rescued this lady. And they didn't see the air, air, aircraft go in. And they thought when they saw this in the sea, they thought it was a, a, a dolphin or a, a seal or something. But uh, she, she never flew again. That was, uh, that was her flight <laughs> forever. 173 were killed flying with ATA. Uh, sometimes this is due to weather conditions, sometimes it would be because it was an aircraft they never flown before. There were always these difficulties of picking up an aircraft you'd never seen before, let alone flown. Oh, I knew one very boy very well who was killed. He, he ended up, I think he was in bad weather, and he flew into a hill and killed himself. One of my best friends was, uh, was uh, killed, unfortunately. The CO would come and tell us uh, there has been an accident. Unfortunately, it was a fatal accident. And uh, so I hope you will understand and uh, have tomorrow off. Don't come in to fly. After that, all will be well. I lost a very dear friend, a man, who was a training with us, and he, he ran, flew into a shag heap on the Motherwell, the, 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 the coal mines all have these shag heaps, and they, he flew into that. Una sola amiga, sí, perdí bastante compañera, pero no amiga. Pero la única que verdaderamente era mi amiga era Bridget Hill, que es well, you couldn't stop and mourn them in the middle of the war. You were much too busy getting on with things. It was after the war that I felt sad, thought of all the people I should have been celebrating with who weren't there anymore. Like Rachel, weeping for her children because they are not. Couldn't forget it. You kept thinking of us all the time when you're flying. And then when you did come down to earth, you sort of think of, think of him all the time. That was a very sad time. But I was lucky, really, to survive it all, where so many of my friends didn't. Mm. It's sad, but inevitable, that there are so few lady members of ATA surviving today. On the 70th anniversary of the start of the Battle of Britain, the ATA were commemorated at Hamble for the work they did in World War II. The monument of a Spitfire was unveiled to them in honour of each and every one of the ATA's work.
This is rather a wonderful day, isn't it? It's lovely to see. And I recognise some of the people who flew with me, so that was lovely. It takes back memories. But it was a wonderful time to be young and alive, I can tell you that, that we had a wonderful life. Beautifully organised, and it's a great tribute to uh, the ATA, of which we are part. Yes. And a lovely Spitfire. What a beautiful model. Really very lucky. Yes. played their role during the war in one way or another and this is why we thought they should be remembered and they should be recognised for what they did at that period. The ladies were first recognised for the work they did in World War II with the Monument for Women in World War II now situated in Whitehall. The monument was unveiled by the Queen in 2005. It was important because I want it to be there for generations of our nation. Whitehall, Westminster, is flooded daily with visitors from this country and from countries overseas. And I wanted them to see that we have a monument recognising and paying tribute to our mothers, our grandmothers, uh, who made sacrifices during World War II. It was uh, hugely important to me that we have something recognising the role of women at that time. The ATA were first recognised as an organisation in 2008 with a trip to 10 Downing Street. We were invited by, by the Prime Minister to 10 Downing Street where we were entertained and given a medal for our achievements during the war. Unfortunately, it came rather late because so many people had passed away and they were the people that really should have had a, the medals. But the few of us that were left accepted these with gratitude. During the war, the ATA flew 415,000 hours and delivered over 308,000 aircraft of 130 types. As Lord Beaverbrook stated at the ATA closing ceremony, they were soldiers fighting in a struggle just as completely as if they had been engaged on the battlefront. The ATA were fundamental to the operation of the RAF during the Second World War and the inclusion of women undoubtedly paved the way for women in aviation today. They prove themselves as proficient pilots and are claimed to be the first ladies to be treated and paid the same as men in the same role. For women to do what they are now doing now in all three flying services, they are flying operational duties exactly in the same way as the men. And I expect that um, that has all could have been made easier by the example shown by the ATA women of World War II. It's funny, but once you've flown, it's a driving thing with you, you know, to get up again. The last time I flew to Dagenham was 2008. I was given a present of a flight. And when I went up there, it was a tiger moss, and it was lovely. I got into the tiger moss, and I was flying around with the instructor, and I asked him if I could fly the aircraft, and he said, me, you've been flying it for the last half hour, and I hadn't realised it. So it only goes to show, it's just like riding a bicycle. <laughs> you never lose it. Wonderful women who did so much in that war effort, took their life into their hands to risk, they risked everything for this country. Inspirational, yet modest ladies. In their eyes, they were just doing their bit for the war effort. The unsung heroes of the Second World War, they are the Spitfire Sisters. Mm -hmm.